Hello out there, all you fabulous flounder. Welcome to another episode of A Little Greener, your favorite podcast all about nature, conservation, and sustainability. I am one of your co-hosts. My name is Sarah, and I am joined today by a new voice, co-host Kristen. Welcome, Kristen. How are you? Thank you. Thank you for having me. I am well, and I'm so excited to be here. Yeah. So for those of you that have been longtime listeners, you may recognize Kristen's voice. She did an episode with us last year, over a year ago, maybe, at this point, on cheetah conservation. A year and a half ago, yeah. Yeah. So I, sadly, was not there for that episode. Kristen, you actually kindly stepped in for me uh, for that episode. And you are now filling in for Casey, who's going to be off for a little extended leave as her family is getting bigger soon. So we're going to have you here for a while. And we're so excited about that. So thanks for coming back and hanging out with us. I'm excited to actually get to do this with you since I missed you last time around. If you haven't listened to our cheetah conservation episode with Kristen, definitely go back and give that a listen. But for those who haven't, Kristen, do you want to just give us the the quick rundown of your sort of a background in the animal conservation world? Sure. And I I probably will repeat myself a little bit for the folks that have listened to that cheetah episode, but my background is in conservation education. So I worked or I used to work with both Sarah and Casey and uh, we were educators together and we had a dream team going on. It was such a great team that we had. And my background, in addition to the education side, I do have a couple of years of experience zookeeping as well. Um, And my favorite animal is the cheetah. So that's uh, why I was so excited to do the cheetah episode. And I do also um, some volunteering for the Cheetah Conservation Fund. So I've got experience all over the place. After I left uh, my education position, I then got into event coordinating for an environmental organization. And now I do environmental grants and programming for a government entity in central Indiana. So a kind of variety of experience, but um, excited to be here. And every single episode I listen to, I learn something. So this is kind of cool to be in this position and, and record with you. So I'm excited. Well, I'm happy to have you. And I'm excited to, in future weeks, to get you to talk a little bit more in depth about what you do. I think what you're doing right now is just so like boots on the ground, sort of frontline kind of conservation work. And it's so, so cool. So excited to have you on board and learn from you as well. You can also check out a quick little bio of Kristen on our social media networks. If you don't follow us there, check that out and you can learn a little bit more about Kristen, but you'll get a chance to do that in weeks to come too. So now that we have a a little bit of your conservation background, Kristen, I have a very important getting to know you question today for our episode. What's your favorite Disney movie? Things everyone needs to know. Okay, this is a very hard question, and I feel like you learn a lot about a person when you ask this question. Exactly. So I have two answers because I can't I can't keep anything brief, which your listeners will find out <laughs> right away. So growing up, my favorite movie uh, was Beauty and the Beast. It was the first movie I saw in the theaters. And I remember having a cute little sleeping bag that was Beauty and the Beast. So that was that was my kind of favorite growing up. Yes. And that didn't necessarily hold true throughout my childhood. I saw all kinds of Disney movies. But then as an adult, um, my favorite is Pirates of the Caribbean, Curse of the Black Pearl. Oh, good choice. Yes. So it is very hard for me to pick one of anything. Give me anything Pixar for sure. But that's my answer for now. That's a good one. It is very true. The same thing with me. If you ask me this question, I've got about five different answers. So yeah, you have your animated answer. You have your live action answer. Mm -hmm. You have your Pixar. You have your computer versus hand drawn. You have your old favorites versus your new favorites. So it, it is hard to just pick one. I would also have multiple answers, but I think for anybody who has known me for any length of time, there is one answer that everybody else would expect to be my top answer, which probably is the truest answer for my favorite, which is The Little Mermaid. Similar to your Beauty and the Beast, this was 
this just hit right. It was at the right moment in childhood for me. This is the the first movie that I I don't actually remember going to see it in theaters, but I remember getting it on my VHS and it just had the the sheet set and the comforter and the shampoo and the bubbles and went as Ariel for Halloween and absolutely I just I was obsessed we had a rule in our house when I was little about one hour of tv or one movie a day and my poor wonderful mother (laughs) had to suffer through the little mermaid every single day for at least a month she thinks we don't remember how long it lasted anymore (laughs) but for a very long time every day my media choice was the little mermaid so i was very excited and anxious when they decided to remake this in the the live action format uh, but i am really excited about it and it did inspire me to to talk about that for tonight's episode i will say as a kid it was not so much the ocean it wasn't you know a movie that inspired me to become enamored with the ocean or marine life or anything like that. It really was about the music for me. I I credit the movie as inspiring a a love of music that still lasts till today. But I do think that especially now having seen this live action, it's, man, how beautiful and diverse and incredible is, is ocean life. Like, I think that's seeing the live action version did make me become more interested in the the animals and the species that are featured in the movie. So I figure what a fun thing to talk about. And that's what we're going to dive into today is the animals of the Little Mermaid and learn a little bit more about Ariel's companions in the movie. So stick around for that discussion. All right, everybody, welcome to our discussion on the animals of The Little Mermaid. A couple of points to you go over before we start. This is not going to be a review of the movie. This isn't going to be a discussion about what the special effects look like or anything like that. We might bring up a couple of details from the plot as they pertain to discussion of the animal species. So if you absolutely don't want to know anything at all about this movie, I would imagine some of our personal opinions about how we, Kristen and I, we have both seen this movie at this point. So some of you might be able to get a sense for how we felt about it as we go along. But uh, if you don't want to know anything, wait, pause the episode, go see the movie, come back and listen. But we're not going to give away any major spoilers or discuss anything major about the plot. So never fear. What this really is going to be is just a little dive into some of the main species that are found in the film. We're not going to do a deep dive into everything, as we'll talk about. There's a lot of marine life out there, and we only have so much time. So we're going to kind of focus on some of the main sidekicks that you know and love from the film. Before we get into those sidekicks, though, I do just want to touch on the main character of the film, because this actually was Again, a very small thing that they added in to this live action version that they I really like that they just touched upon uh, for a moment, which is sort of the connection that mermaids have to marine mammals and the idea that there is evidence that sailors would confuse animals like manatees and dugongs for mermaids. You know, I heard that as well, and I don't quite get it, um, because anyone that's seen a manatee, I wouldn't say they're very elegant. (laughs) Right? Or very (laughs) human-shaped. Right. More (laughs) potato-shaped. More (laughs) potato-shaped, exactly. So this is is not, uh, to clarify, this is not where the idea of mermaids came from. Mer- mermaids did not originate with these sailors. The myths have been around for a long, long time in, in different cultures. And so maybe that's partially why. But I always just think, like, how ill or lonely <laughs> were these <laughs> sailors uh, to mistake animals like manatees and dugongs? Yeah, so that, I, that's the same thought, Kristen, that I have. 
but it it is kind of interesting. So first of all, maybe they were sort of primed by the the prevalence of mermaids in myths and legends to to think that that's what they were seeing out there. But I did find as I was just trying to read a little bit more about the background and the history of this occurrence with sailors, I did come up with this article from Snopes, actually, which will be linked in our show notes. But it is a passage taken from the 1831 Arcana of Science and Art, a British magazine of natural history, if you're curious. And this little excerpt that they have is about uh, somebody who had brought in a skeleton, presumably of a mermaid, for study. Hmm. And it was determined to be a dugong. And this little excerpt, whoever wrote this, says, It was, if I recalled right, about six feet long, the lower dorsal vertebrae with the broad caudal extremity suggested the idea of a powerful fish-like termination, whilst the forelegs, from the scapula to the extremities of the phalanges, presented to the unskillful eye an exact resemblance to the bones of a small female arm. And when I read that, I was like, okay, like from a skeletal standpoint, this whole thing makes a whole lot more sense. You know? I feel like I need to now look up a picture of a Dugan skeleton. I'm pretty sure there is one on the Snopes article, so you can look in the show notes as well, Chris. I will. Thank (laughs) you. So I'll have that for you. But it, it, it is very true. If you imagine somebody who's never actually seen a skeleton before in real life, but would kind of have a general idea of what our bones look like, you imagine just the bottom half being a tail. And we've seen Kristen's uh, skeleton replicas of say the the fins of a, a dolphin the pectoral fins and that is very much just a a sort of shrunken version of our arm bones it's very much the exact the, the analogous bone structure there so i just thought that was interesting and that sort of made me understand a little bit more where people who have been primed to this idea of mermaids might see something like a dugong or a manatee skeleton and be like, oh my gosh, this is, it's a mermaid. You know, so this is kind of interesting. I did just Google a, a picture and I, I can see it. Yeah. The skull is way different. But yeah. <laughs> if you're just looking at it very quickly, I mean, they do look like kind of small human arms. Yeah. If you're just like quickly glancing. Absolutely. So I, I get five it. five digits, yep the Mm -hmm. scapula, humerus, radius, ulna, it's all there. So just kind of an interesting aside that, again, I thought was fun. They included this idea in a very small way in the the live action that I thought was fun. But let's move on. If you're familiar with the Little Mermaid Disney version at all, you know we've got three main pals that Ariel hangs out with throughout the movie that we're going to discuss. And first up is Scuttle. Again, minor spoilers if you don't want to know anything about this, but if you've seen any sort of promotional material for this movie, you've probably already realized that Scuttle has is a different species. Scuttle in the animated ver- version was a gull. And we've switched now to uh, a bird that I previously wasn't familiar with. And this is also, this is the only species that I have seen officially stated by the makers of the movie. So this one, we know for sure uh, what species we're dealing with, which is a gannet. And I believe a northern gannet. There's three species of gannets, but based on range and where I am guessing that this very fictional movie sort of is is intended to take place, we're looking at a northern gannet. In the movie, Kristen, I know you have referred to yourself as a bird nerd in the past. Well, this would not be a bird that we would encounter around here. Are you familiar with gannets at all? I would definitely call myself a bird nerd. I do love birds. I love going birding. I love bird watching. I am not familiar with them. I am, I'm most familiar with Midwestern birds yeah. for sure. But I do know gannets are are pretty good divers. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm sure you'll you'll probably talk about that. And they can dive uh, pretty fairly deep. So yeah. that is one major attribute I am familiar with. Yeah. I was not familiar with gannets at all. I don't think that I would have even 
you know, listed them as a species that I'd ever heard of prior to this. So gannets are seabirds and they are pretty large. They can be up to like three, three and a half feet long. So if uh, albatross would be another example of a seabird that probably more people are familiar with as, as very large birds. So they are almost albatross sized. Like I mentioned, there's three living species. They're really pretty. Like, I really like the look of the bird. They are mostly white and black, but they have this sort of yellow buff color on their heads and almost these bluish gray long bills. I think they're lovely birds. Yes. And there's like, it's almost like a pretty gradient too between yeah. those two colors. And it makes me curious as to kind of what that coloration is for. Yeah. I mean, we know in general, especially male birds have the bright coloration to show yeah. off to the females, but I'm, I'm just curious, like it's such a bright contrast. Yeah. And I certainly did not look into it. So we'll have to do some more research on what, yeah. what we even know about the gannet. But I did look into, we have recently done an episode on parental care in animals. And we talk with about birds a lot, how oftentimes it's both the male and females that are involved in care. And so I did read about that. And both males and females do defend the nest for gannets, which they nest on cliff ledges. So Dangerous. they will, yeah, right. So they will, <laughs> you, over the, the winter time, the non-breeding season, they'll be further south and then they go up north and will, will nest on these cliff ledges. And they do mate for life, which is a thing that I think is pretty common with seabirds as well. But with some birds, they'll be described as monogamous, but they'll actually only stay with the same partner for the, the one breeding season. And then they might have another partner the next year. But these guys are will, will mate for life. So they'll return to the same partners the same colonies in in multiple years through breeding seasons which i just kind of enjoy but you mentioned kristen the, the big thing the big reason for the change in species for the movie and what i think is the most impressive thing about gannets too is that they are diving birds so these birds will dive underwater and this is not like you know, a, a duck who's sitting on the surface of the water and, and propels themselves down. They will dive, according to Cornell's All About Birds website, he will dive from as high as 100 feet in the air at up to 60 miles an hour into the Whoa. ocean. I can't dive at all. Like, I don't know that I've ever successfully dove into a body of water, but I've sure belly flopped into <laughs> a body of water going not anywhere close to 60 miles an hour. And I cannot imagine we're talking the height of a 10 story building. Mm. First of all, I can't see 10 feet in front of me. So I can't imagine <laughs> diving 100 feet into the water to catch mm -hmm. a fish. So that's bonkers. In and of they itself. must also have fairly good eyesight if they're diving yeah, from that high I would up. imagine so. And also, I think probably looking for schools of, of fish as mm -hmm. well. So, but And then they can go to depths of, of up to about 72 feet or so. And so they'll dive into the water and then they will also propel themselves further once they're, they're in the water to go under. So, And they'll even sometimes eat small fish under the water, although they will also come up to the surface to eat too if they need to adjust. So I came across a few adaptations that helped them to do this. One that was mentioned was a reinforced skull, although I couldn't find much detail around that. That may just also have to do with musculature around their skull, I am not sure. Uh, but also a bony plate at the base of the bill and specialized neck muscles that helped them to survive impact. And I should not even try to describe physics things because I don't like physics. But what I was reading was talking about how there is a phase basically as they're diving. So their head goes into the water, obviously. And so then there's this sort of moment where their head is decelerating. So their head is slowing down, but the rest of their body is still kind of accelerating into the water. So they have these specialized neck muscles that will contract and stabilize their neck as they're going into the water so they don't just compress all of their neck vertebrae together. Oh my gosh, that's insane. Crazy. <laughs> Crazy. <gasps> and then they can stay underwater for around 30 seconds is typically what I was reading. And that's the reason for the change. 
according to the makers of this live action movie, is to have Scuttle be able to come below the surface of the water. They use some creative license with having that happen. But again, we're talking about talking birds. So I think mm-hmm. I think it's okay. And I think it's cool. I, I, I really like this change. I think it introduces people to a new species of animal that they might be unfamiliar with. And it adds, I think, a little bit to the storyline too. So this was a fun one. Yes, I, I agree. It definitely added a little bit uh, to the story. And I don't want to say made it more realistic because, it, like you said, How it's a talking you go bird. With that, yeah. but... <laughs> but but I think there's an element. Yeah, there's an element of realism. Yes, absolutely. And then this was just a fun thing that I found. I, I don't think that this really has anything to do with anything or or have any feeling that this was intentional. But if you think about Scuttle's character from the movie, he's had these sort of ideas that he knew things about the human world and Ariel would bring her collections of things to have him identify things. This is just something that I came across in in reading about these birds is that northern gannets will sometimes incorporate odd objects into their nest, which are otherwise mostly comprised of seaweed, mud, feathers, and and excrement. Lovely. But uh, this article said among the prizes found by Gannett researchers in nest walls have been a plastic frog, shotgun shell casing, rope, lobster pot tags, false teeth, uh, other things like a gold watch, a fountain pen, and golf balls. And while there's certainly a lot sad uh, about that, and we can talk about marine debris and that sort of thing, it it did just make me smile in thinking about this in relation to Scuttle a little bit. When what I wouldn't give to see a photograph of that gannet holding those false teeth. Like, <laughs> did it hold it in its mouth? You know, do we have any artistic listeners out there that can draw this? I would like to request that drawing. Uh, I seconded. <laughs> that did not cross my mind, but I 100% second that. You would think they would have to be carrying it in their beak. I don't think their feet. They're like, yep, feet? I feel like they would have to. That's mm-hmm. amazing. And then I'm just picturing, you know, Scuttle's voice <laughs> as they're carrying all these things back, you know, not knowing exactly what they are. Oh, I love it. So that just brought a little smile to my face, even though, like I said, from a, a conservation standpoint, hey, let's stop throwing our trash uh, out onto the shoreline or into Mm -hmm. the ocean would be a good idea. Also, from a conservation standpoint, though, I'm happy to report that northern gannets are currently listed as least concern, and their population is thought to be increasing, so that's great. Years, Many years ago, they were under threat due to over-collection of their eggs and also harvesting for their feathers, which is something we've talked about with, with bird species before, feathers for fashion and that sort of thing. And seabirds as a whole, there's a lot of range in the conservation status of different seabird species, and a lot of seabirds, including northern gannets, even though their population is good right now, are under threat from bycatch. Bycatch can be a serious problem for seabirds, and again, you know, thinking they're out there looking for food, looking for those schooling fish, where are fish going to potentially be schooling, where the fishing boats are, so... Uh, getting caught on lines in the water and that sort of thing are are a threat to seabirds. So, all right, scuttle check one down, two to go. Let's move on to Sebastian. Yes, and just a little disclaimer before we get started. So, I used to work with a sloth named Sebastian, oh. and I will try really hard oh. not to get them confused because you pronounce them a little differently. So circling back to your sloth episode, I also love, love sloths. And I had a favorite one named Sebastian. So I will try. (laughs) It's funny because I always had a hard time pronouncing his name because I just was more inclined to say Sebastian. So, Mm -hmm. oh man, that's funny. I didn't even think about that. Full circle. We we will understand whichever way it comes out is fine. (laughs) Uh, So I was surprised. This ended up being perhaps the most challenging species for me to research, Kristen. And I was also surprised to learn when I started researching that there was actually some confusion back around the animated version over whether or not Sebastian was a crab or a lobster. I Mm. never, there was never a question to me. He was very clearly a crab Mm -hmm. in the movie. 
he doesn't have the long tail that lobsters will have. I believe that lobsters are only red once they're dead mm-hmm. also. Yep. And even when I was five and didn't know those things, they also call him a crab multiple times yes. in the movie. So yes. It's clear to me that he was a crab, but he's definitely not an accurate depiction uh, of a crab. Obviously, these are very anthropomorphized cartoons. So I do think that he, he definitely now looks like a crab in the live action. I do think the live action does take some creative license here too based on the best of my research abilities so let's talk a little bit about crabs crabs live in a lot of different habitats and i think i always sort of took that for granted again from the time that i was little it just made sense to me that sebastian went in and out of the water the way that he did and that you do see crabs in the water you see crabs out of the water i am not really an ocean or marine person. I've not studied ocean animals a lot. So I think even as an adult and somebody who's interested in nature, I just sort of took it for granted that crabs uh, were were in both places. So they do live in a variety of habitats. Some are saltwater species, some are freshwater species, some are strictly terrestrial, at least in their adult life. Kristen, have you encountered crabs in the wild at all? I have. I could not tell you for the life of me what species. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, which type of crab. Um, but I do remember, you know, going on family vacations um, to Florida and things and seeing like yeah. little, they were very small little yeah. guys. I don't know what kind, but I do remember seeing them and getting excited just because I don't ever see animals like that in the Midwest. In the Midwest. <laughs> yeah. I So I just recently had an experience encountering crabs in the wild when I last year visited Sanibel Island and I was out birding with my dad early in the morning and we were watching birds catch crabs that were on the ground um and I I'm not sure what all kinds of crabs those were then we were walking out along a dock and as we were walking back in towards the road I saw a crab in a tree and then as we Whoa. stopped to look around, it was like the trees were covered in these little crabs. I wish I'd put a picture in here. I forgot to do it for you, Kristen. But I so I did look those up and I think they were called mangrove tree crabs. Cool. And so that, yeah, it just opens your eyes to really the variety of places <laughs> that you can find these animals. So there's just a lot more variety, I think, than I realized in the crab world. There's thousands of different species. In looking at Sebastian in this live action version, I think the most distinctive thing about him are those long eye stalks, which I think mm-hmm. threw a lot of people off as well. It looks very different to the cartoon Sebastian, but this is actually very accurate for crabs that they have their eyes on these movable eye stalks and they can retract them if needed into tight spaces and different species will have sort of different length and size of of eye stalks so this is is very true to life and sort of just based on his overall depiction with those pretty long prominent eye stalks his color and his small size the main crab that pops up when i started to look into this is the the ghost crab and again there are, there are actually lots of different species of of ghost crab but i think the eye stalks and the fact that if you look uh, at sebastian he has his claws are are two different sizes which is true of obviously you think of like the fiddler crabs are the ones that are super lopsided right that have the one really big claw and the other small one his is not that pronounced but ghost crabs do have those those claws of two different sizes so i think his overall look is consistent with a ghost crab however the more that i was reading about ghost crabs they're I was typically seeing them described as either terrestrial or semi-terrestrial. And it seems like, at least with the species that I was reading about, that they will go in shallow water to get their gills wet, but they actually would not be able to survive being completely submerged for long periods of time. And I couldn't get a lot of information on that. It just seems like different species of crabs will have gills 
that their structure is slightly different or they're ad- adapted in slightly different ways where some uh, basically all they need is to stay a little bit damp. And so those semi-terrestrial or terrestrial species of crabs just need a little bit of water, even like wicking moisture from the sand or getting moisture out of the air. Uh, and that's all that they need to keep their gills wet. And something about the way that they function prohibits them from being completely submerged in, in deep water. And I, I couldn't really garner a whole lot more uh, in-depth information uh, than that. But it does seem like a true ghost crab would not be able to do the in and out like Sebastian does in the movie. And that was going to be my main question for you, because in the movie, and this isn't really a spoiler, because it's like this in the the uh, animated version as well, is Sebastian spends a lot of time in the water mm-hmm. and he swims really well yeah. in the water. And I didn't know if that was accurate. I don't know a lot about crabs. Yeah. So that's interesting. So I, again, just never really thought about it. Never. I, I always took it for granted, but apparently, yeah, a lot of crabs actually cannot swim. They will walk in the water. There is a group of crabs or tuna day, maybe. I don't know if I'm saying Sounds that good to me. correctly. <laughs> sure. Uh, so they have, crabs have 10 legs. And so for the, these this group of crabs that are known as the swimming crabs, they actually have a flattened pair of back legs that they will use as a paddle. So there are multiple species of crab that have this. I actually think Sebastian's legs are flattened in the movie. I, I need to go see it again. Uh, but I was trying to find some clips that show it and they certainly do show him swimming. And I, I do think that they actually do have those back legs flattened, which again, to me, just means that maybe they've taken some traits from different species of crabs. Cause I could not find a swimming crab that fit that description. And if you look at a a lot of the species of crabs that pull up when you look at this group of swimming crabs, I think they're even less sort of emotive than the ghost crabs. You look up a picture, folks who are listening, of a ghost crab. I think they're really cute. (laughs) So, (laughs) And I think that that is important in this visual media that we're talking about when we're giving, giving these animals human voices and asking viewers to to like them, basically, uh, having that sort of emotive component is really important. And I think some of these other species of crabs, just the the shape of their bodies, their less pronounced eye stalks, all of those things, I think it would be even harder for anybody watching the movie to sort of accept this as a sort of talking animal. So I can understand uh, where they they pull some of these traits from. So long story short, I I like the the visual of of Sebastian. I think that maybe he's a mix of multiple crab species, but maybe most closely visually modeled after the ghost crab. That's For what I sure. got. But, but, and also just that crabs are fascinating. Like there's just so much more diversity to this group of animals than I realized. And a lot of things that I kind of took for granted, I think. Okay. Number three. I'm, this is maybe the one that I'm most excited to talk about as well. Me too. Which is Flounder. So the first thing to note is that Flounder is the name of the character. Flounder is not. Flounder has never been the type of fish that this character was modeled after. Kristen, I have a picture of an actual Flounder in the outline for you. Could you kindly give a a little description of what an actual Flounder looks like? Yes, absolutely. So definitely not as as vibrant and colorful as the movie, but more of a, a kind of a drab coloration and very flat. Yeah. Uh, they swim like along the bottom and, and blend in pretty well with the sand. And it looks, it's kind of hard to describe if you've never seen a flounder, but it looks like both of their eyes are kind of like on the top. Uh-huh. And it's very strange. And I think a better depiction of a flounder is not in this movie, but is from SpongeBob. Did you ever watch SpongeBob? I did not watch SpongeBob. No, I I missed that boat. Okay, where are all my SpongeBob fans at? <laughs> Flats the Flounder is a character in SpongeBob, and it's a much more accurate depiction of an actual 
flounder. So that is what I think of. And then I also, I'm a big Animal Crossing fan, and they have an olive flounder in the game that you can catch when you go out fishing. And that one is also a pretty good uh, depiction of an actual flounder. All right. So I have some yeah. pop culture references to look into after this episode. But yeah, flounder, the animated fish is like as far opposite as you can get from a real flounder as possible. Flounder in the movie is this sort of big, round, vibrantly colored fish. Flounders, there's actually multiple species that are referred to as a flounder. They are in a group of fish that is literally called flatfish because they are flat instead of swimming. uh, How would you say it? Where they're sort of, you know, you would you think of a fish, I think, typically as being sort of laterally compressed from side to side and longer from top to bottom. Flatfish are the opposite. They're flat like a plate. And just as you said, Kristen, the, the flounder's coloration is designed to blend in, not to stand out. They can change their color to blend in with their surroundings, usually on the seafloor and so they're blending in with the sand basically around them so really drab and their eyes it's crazy so yes their eyes are on the same side of their head and they kind of like bulge out a little bit which is not what they think about with fish I I actually did not know this until I started researching for this episode this is not how they start out so little tiny flounder larvae whatever they're called Little little baby fish fry flounder. <laughs> uh, their eyes are on the opposite side of their heads, like okay. a normal fish. Uh-huh. And then one of their eyes migrates. And that's how it is, is described, is their eye migrates from one side to the other now, as they grow. And we're talking like little tiny, like translucent little tiny fish. So it's not, don't, if you're imagining like I was, like a fully grown fish with its eye like... <laughs> moving across the head. Yeah. but there is a video that will be linked in the show notes Kristen I'm actually going to have you pull up this video right now okay I'm ready okay it's moving oh man it's happening okay isn't that crazy All so right. again we're imagining this is a, a little tiny thing I, I, we're looking Still. at it under a microscope I'm sure in, in this video but isn't everyone, that crazy? Everyone needs to go watch this movie. Oh my gosh, that was so <laughs> weird. I yeah. understand it's a, it's very small, so we're looking at a, a pretty zoomed in view. Yeah, but it's still it's, like it, it kind of completely morphs into a different shape, like the yeah. whole fish as it grows. That is wild. Yeah, I just had no idea. And apparently, different species of flounder, the, the the migration happens a little bit differently structurally, and all of that. Uh, but it's very interesting. So that's mm-hmm. a real flounder. That's what happens with them. Obviously, going back to flounder, Ariel's companion. This is not the type of fish he is. So, what kind of fish? is flounder in the movie now with regards to the live action because here again we're there's not really much correlation between the animated and the live action other than the color so that was kind of the first thing that i went off of when trying to research this i did think that i recognized the species of fish when I first saw the promotional material come out. But like I said, I'm not an ocean person. I couldn't bring to mind what the fish species would be. I just thought that it was something that I recognized. So you think bright colors, we think about tropical reef fish. So I did a very, very scientific Google search of fish with yellow stripes uh and that turned up a a lot of fish like um i think the the copper banded butterfly fish was the one that came up most or first when i was using this but that's the wrong shape for live action version of flounder closer though kristen to if you wanted to stretch maybe the shape of what animated version of flounder is, but you have another possibility for animated flounder that I really like. So I also did a very educated uh, Google search (laughs) and I I 
kind of knew what the answer was going to be. And that is, you know, it's probably not any specific species at all. And that they took yeah. very creative freedom yeah. and just created a cute fish. But I think for the animated version, it's closely, as close as you can get, uh, resembles a, a regal or sometimes called royal angelfish. Um, so very, very bright yellow coloration and has the blue stripes. So uh, close-ish, I would yeah. say. I like that match for the animated version and just a, a cool looking fish again. So if you're not familiar, look them up. Reef fish are so beautiful. So yeah, I like that. And then I'm fairly confident. Again, I haven't seen this confirmed officially anywhere, but I feel pretty good that live action flounder is modeled after a sergeant major is the type of fish. So this is a reef associated fish that's found in warm Atlantic waters. It is a schooling fish, which is not a behavior <laughs> that we see. What if poor flounder, if the reason that he's so anxious all the time is because he's just separated from his school. Oh no. Right? Ugh. We need a we need a finding Nemo flounder you know, version. New movie. Finding Flounder. Oh Disney, get on this. Uh, so funny. Uh, but there, there were again just a couple, uh, just I guess one mainly fun thing. Again, I'm pretty confident just based on the visual that this is the, the type of fish that we're talking about here. I did like this little tidbit that I found related to Sergeant Majors uh, from the Florida Museum that says that. Juvenile sergeant majors are found in specific habitats, often schooling close to caves, shipwrecks, or other protected objects. And again, if you're familiar with The Little Mermaid at all, you know why it just brought a smile to my face to see flounder associated with shipwrecks. So that's a fun one. But again, I'm pretty confident here on this species. Absolutely. And so since we've kind of briefly talked about all three of the kind of sidekicks and we have our best guess for the species that they might be does it fit in with about where this movie is supposed to take place where does it take place do we know i think that this version is going it's caribbean somewhere and i do think that yeah at least loosely based on these guesses that we have again that's sort of why i picked the northern gannet species the others i think one's found around africa and the other oh my gosh i can't remember maybe australia indo-pacific no somewhere idea. out there i think <laughs> maybe don't quote me on that 100 percent. but yeah so the northern gannet's the one that um at least in non nesting season they can be found further south so yeah i think they're reasonable again i, th I think they're taking liberties for sure but again it really is a, a, a it's a made-up story also mm -hmm. um, but I do think it all loosely fits and it was fun it was just sort of again this is a thing that I have loved since I was five years old so it's just it was fun to kind of bring that back around now that I am in the animal field and uh, to kind of take a closer look at the potential background of some of these species. So I enjoyed doing it. But also, Kristen, we've talked on the podcast before about how things like this can be a catalyst for people. And so that's why, you know, it's, it is just a fun thing. But also we know as conservation educators that you have to make nature relevant for people. And so I do really hope as it did for me watching it this time around, that having this movie in a live action version really will help, especially younger people, but really anybody that goes to watch it, have maybe a newfound at least appreciation for marine life and maybe spark some people to to learn a little bit more like we did. Yeah, absolutely. It can definitely uh, be the spark and at least get people interested in marine life and maybe doing some further research. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Kristen. What a fun first discussion to have with you. I appreciate all of your insight uh, as well. Do you have anything to add before we take a break and wrap things up with our challenges? Just maybe a little shout out. Um, if we have any new listeners, I'm not the, the voice that you'll hear on the rest of the podcast, but thanks for joining 
And we hope you stick around. Um, and special shout out my sister-in-law, Courtney. How's it going? Thanks for being a new listener. Yay! Welcome, Courtney. Thanks for listening. And yeah, thanks, Kristen. That was great. That was lots of fun. We're not done yet. Stick around, everybody. We will be right back with our challenge for the week. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for listening. I really had fun with this episode, both researching and chatting about it with you, Kristen. Uh, but I do hope that this, you know, people can can grab something new maybe from this one and perhaps be inspired to learn a little bit more about ocean life, which is vastly still unknown. You know, we have, I think, over 80% of the ocean that hasn't been mapped or explored in any way like it's it's there's such a small percentage of the ocean that we actually know about this thus far so it is really fascinating to to learn about so hopefully this will uh, help jumpstart all of us myself included to learn a little bit more and Kristen I have to thank you for our first challenge this week because you mentioned this to me this is a person that I follow, but had had sort of fallen off of my social media radar here. I wasn't seeing a lot of her posts. So you brought this to my attention. But first challenge for you all in a, a way that you can maybe start to learn a little bit more about ocean life is to follow Danny Washington on social media. Danny Washington is a science communicator, ocean advocate, extremely passionate about the ocean and marine species and you can follow her her personal account which i do and then she also has a couple of her th the sort of projects that she does so you can follow uh the big blue and you which is an ocean conservation organization that she co-founded and you can also just visit their website as well at bigblueandyou.org and then she also has a social media account for it's on Instagram. It's at XXI Mermaids, which is 21st Century Mermaids. This is a podcast that she hosts. I have not actually listened to it because I'm terrible about listening to podcasts, but I love the idea of this. It is dedicated or focused on uh, women in marine science. And so they'll interview different women uh, in this field that are doing a lot to protect and explore our oceans. So a couple of, of really good organizations that you can follow. And I say I have, have you to thank Kristen because you let me know that Danny has been very vocal on her Instagram, which I did look up about how she also loves The Little Mermaid and was inspired by the movie when she was a kid to learn about the ocean. So that I thought was beautiful and made me so happy. I love Danny Washington. I, I already follow her, but I will now listen to her podcast. I was fortunate enough to meet her in person not too terribly Ugh. long ago. She was at an event in central Indiana, um, an, a conservation-related event, and she is so smart and so kind, and you can just tell she is so passionate about what she does. So I'm so happy you put this uh, challenge in our episode today. Well, thanks for making me aware. Like I said, I, I followed her as well, but it had just, you know, you know how social media gets, you just stop seeing things. So I'm, I'm mm -hmm. glad to have brought her back to the, the forefront of my social media following. So appreciate the heads up there. And then second one that I, I came across, I was looking for something kind of related to maybe one of the specific species. So I did find a citizen science project that you could get involved in from wherever you live. This is on the, the website Zooniverse, which we've talked about before, but you can search through there. There's lots of, of different projects that you can do, but this is with Seabird Watch in particular. They have a citizen science project going. It's not with gannets. It's with, I, I think they have a, another two different kinds of seabirds that they're focusing on there, but it's basically just photo identification. So they have lots of photos and they're looking at doing surveys of bird populations. So you go through photos and mark the birds that you're seeing. I went to this project. It does look like it's maybe a little bit challenging uh, with the, the photos that they have. So maybe not for 
young children, but if you are listening out there and interested in trying your hand getting involved in some citizen science projects, you can certainly look into Seabird Watch and see if that's a a way that you want to spend some of your time. I might have to try that. I used to do quite a bit with camera traps at my old job and identifying photos, and I miss it. I I loved everything about it, setting up the traps and, and IDing all the photos, so I might have to check that out. Awesome. Kristen, it was so much fun. I'm so excited to be doing this to you. Obviously, shout out to Casey. I told her yesterday that I already miss our our weekly chats, but I'm so excited for her as she enters this sort of new phase of life. Hopefully, she's listening at some point. So hi, Casey. We're thinking of you. Uh, But Kristen, I'm so happy to have you here and I'm excited to to do this with you and I really appreciate you taking time out of your very busy schedule to do this with me. I appreciate you as well and it's kind of weird to think that you know Casey could be listening right now and you probably have your baby by the time this comes out (laughs) you will probably have your little baby so hi Casey and hi little baby. Yay I love it. All right, folks, thank you for listening. We really appreciate uh, you taking time out of your day to listen to us as well. If you have any questions, comments, thoughts, feedback, suggestions for future episodes, we are all over the place. You can find us on social media. We're on Facebook at A Little Greener Podcast. We're on Instagram at A Little Greener Pod. We are on Twitter at A Greener Podcast. And you can email us at A Little Greener Podcast at gmail.com. You can also find our more recent episodes on YouTube, A Little Greener Podcast, uh, with captions there if that is something that is helpful for you. So we always love to hear from you. So find us wherever. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to learn more and, and dive into some more topics with you. Awesome, folks. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good night. We'll talk to you in a couple weeks. See ya. See ya.